All right, thank you for joining us again, people. It is the Higher Man Podcast. Uh, today it is the 8th of February, Wednesday. Currently it is 3.43 in the afternoon. Um, episode 25 coming back. Good to be back. Uh, thanks for joining us again. How are we doing today, Pete? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Oh, pretty good, thanks. Pretty good. The weather's starting to... Well, not weather, but like, it seems to be a bit more sunlight in the air in the day now, so it's kind of a bit more... Uh, Bit more pleasing to wake up, which is nice. Slowly getting to summer, so a bit of yeah, distance that's away, good. you know. But yes, uh, yeah. So today our episode will be focused on chapter one of Jordan Peterson's Twelve Rules for Life. Uh, as you can guess, chapter one is rule one. It is rule one is called stand up straight with your shoulders back uh, so we're going to discuss that uh, how it kind of applies to our lives and hopefully you can have a few key takeaways from here to implement into your own lives and to see any improvements um but yeah do you want to get started pete yeah sounds good yes sorry so uh first of all john peterson kind of goes on to talk about uh, lobsters uh, lobsters have been around for a lot longer than I realised, um, somewhere like 350 million years, which probably isn't that long when you think about the uh, whole entirety, entire history of the whole Earth, but it's quite long compared to uh, other species that are around today. It's older than trees, dinosaurs, definitely humans. Um, thankfully, they've been around for a long time, so they're, uh, they're kind of um, people, you could argue that almost like infinite in time compared to the time we've experienced uh, as a species. And because of that, we can kind of rely on their neural networks to get findings from and kind of decipher what um, what happens in the brain and stuff when other things happen. But getting into it straight away then, lobsters have neural networks that are quite easy to study. Um, and as I said, because they've kind of been around for an infinite amount of time almost, it seems like the data is quite conclusive and it's quite informative. And for some reason, it's quite applicable to humans and other species in the world as well, which is helpful because uh, it's teaching us a few things. But one thing that it does teach us is that serotonin is a huge, um, huge important factor when it comes to um, mental health and physical health. And in lobsters, serotonin is kind of dictated by the fights they have for territory and for mates and for dominance in the hierarchy. So lobsters will go on to fight fight each other for, uh, for to show their dominance, get a nice hunting grounds, get a nice home and habitat, and hopefully attract a mate in the future. But when they do fight, there's obviously going to be a winner and a loser. Um, and... Unfortunately for the loser, when they are defeated, what happens in their brain is that a part of their brain dissolves and then is regrown because the part of their brain that dissolves doesn't have the ability to um, to deal with the change and transformations of becoming a lower status lobster. Um, and part of that change involves lowering serotonin levels and increasing octopamine levels. Um, we're going to focus on serotonin levels because we share that chemical um, with the lobsters. We don't share octopamine in our systems. Um, but yeah, so do you want to talk about serotonin a little bit, Pete? Yeah, so so as you mentioned, it's something that stems uh, is far more fundamental than than humans are. It's existed for a far longer time than humans have, and it kind of shows that the dominance hierarchy and this kind of innate inequality that we experience in social groups is kind of a constant throughout existence um, as it exists in, in lobsters, which we departed from some 300 million years ago or something, something like that. Um, so about serotonin itself, um, you know, there's a lot that can be said about it in, in humans. It's, um, 
it, it's commonly associated with levels of happiness and kind of life satisfaction. Um, and people will take SSRIs, um, which affect the serotonin system to treat depression. And it turns out you can use the same, um, uh, the same, the same medication on lobsters and it will increase their willingness to fight and, uh, that kind of displays of dominance. So, so yeah, it's quite a fundamental part of, of life as, as we know it and as we experience it. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, one of the kind of things that comes from lowering your serotonin in, in a lobster is like you said, they're less willing to fight, but they also show less dominance physically. Um, like they kind of hunch themselves over and are less, um, less, they don't present themselves as big because they don't believe themselves to be as dominant almost, even though it's kind of like an unconscious thing that happens. Um, but the serotonin is definitely, um, responsible for that and responsible for the dominant people maintaining that dominance as well. So when they have more serotonin, they're going to be more confident in fighting. And one of the things that lobsters do when they kind of initiate a fight, it doesn't go straight into a brawl. It kind of, they both um, kind of set each other up to start each other up. And they apparently that they spray chemicals at each other, at each other, and that informs the other of the uh, lobsters like almost previous like dominance and like how strong they kind of are. And from that, a lobster can choose to run away and flee the scene if they feel like the opposing or lobster will kill them. Or if they think the chemicals that have informed them have informed them that the lobster is actually weaker so they can defeat it, um, which is quite important. Um, but one thing I was, was thinking of, like I mentioned earlier that when a def lobster is defeated, they kind of have a part of their brain that dissolves and it kind of regrows to be more appropriate for their new position in the dominant hierarchy. I was thinking if we apply that to humans, would it be beneficial for humans to forget kind of like their past uh, and that includes defeats and success? to focus on their new position or possibly focus on like how they can work harder to gain something in the future. What do you think about the benefit of like almost forgetting your previous, um, experiences? Yeah. So obviously for a lobster, their, their brain has to, they have, they're not the most complex creature and in terms of like their brain, they don't have a, complex brain compared to humans. So they're not able to kind of actively adapt to new scenarios. Rather, they have to kind of destroy their brain and create a new one in order to adjust to the new situation. Whereas with humans, we have a greater ability to, um, kind of adapt to different situations and to kind of rewire our brain without having to completely destroy it. Um, that would be quite counterproductive i think but um mm -hmm. but to your question about how about whether it's good for us to kind of forget our past mistakes and or maybe our past successes as well in order to have a better future you know it's it's tough to say i think it talks about later on in the chapter how a lot of people have kind of adaptive mechanisms for dealing with situations in their life that they may experience in the past. So they may learn if they were abused by their parents, they may learn to be extremely submissive because that would have maybe prevented them from any, any signs of confrontation from them would result in them suffering more. So they've adapted to, to that, or it could be a similar case for something like bullying at school, but for whatever reason, um, people can build up these adaptive mechanisms, which as you grow older are no longer adaptive, they only serve to kind of harm you. Um, and I think it's quite an important realization for people to think that, you know, I was this certain way in the past and perhaps that was, perhaps there was reasons for that, which 
which kept me safe or avoided me getting in trouble. But that now moving on, we kind of need to realize that the, these type of things aren't productive to us anymore. And we need to learn to kind of let them go and, and to realize that we don't need them anymore and have an ability to become a new person from that. Yeah. So it's almost like a, um, lobsters like physically dissolve the, the mechanisms in their brains, but you could argue that humans would benefit from dissolving me like metaphorically and spiritually, maybe not spiritually, but more like metaphorically, the, um, mechanisms which serve them in the past, but now considering that the conditions have changed and they're in a new, new situation, those mechanisms are more defeating than serving. Yeah. Maybe a lesson could be yeah. learned to, from it. And like, it's like that, the idea of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea from like Nietzsche about creative destruction, like there needs to be a destroyed, uh, there needs to be some sort of destruction in order for there to be like a new creative, um, maybe innovation or something like, along the lines of that. Yeah. I just, yeah, I do just think it's a very important realization for people to, to realize that just because they are a certain way now, or they have been a certain way in the past, and that may have been formed by their circumstances, it doesn't mean that they have to carry on in that way in the future if, if they want to change. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of brings us on to our next point about integrating the shadow and it's kind of summed up by what you said, but, um, how do you think, well, we did a whole episode on like integrating the shadow and kind of ways to do it and why it's important. How do you think it's kind of applicable here though, to, like specific to standing up with your shoulders back and stuff? Yeah. So I think, you know, the standing up with your shoulders back is kind of a metaphor, uh, as mentioned in the book, I'm not sure if you have the quote there, but it's about kind of taking on like voluntarily standing up to the challenges of life and yeah. that's kind of a spiritual a mental and a psychological thing um so so yeah in terms of integrating the shadow i think this is kind of realizing you know part of integrating the shadow is related to what we were just saying about realizing that you have an ability to change and you know, how do you, how do you think relate, this relates to the shadow in terms of integrating a part of yourself that is hidden away uh, and how that relates to what we've just been saying about having the ability to change when maybe you have previous adaptive mechanisms? Yeah. Well, um, you were mentioning that, like, I think an example you gave is when you have like kind of over strict and over aggressive parents children learn to um to create these mechanisms where they sit down quietly and they kind of don't react and they don't make any noises in order to not annoy their parents um, and that kind of extends to everybody in their life they become shy and they become timid and don't want to cause any disruption to anybody and that mechanism gets learned and a way that it kind of relates to standing up straight with the shoulders back is and, and also to the shadow is like those people that learn those mechanisms, they view tyranny, or sorry, they view any act of like aggression and violence as tyrannical and something that should never be um, thought about, let alone acted out. And in order to kind of change the way they are, they need to integrate the shadow and realize and have the ability to act out um, the capacity for aggression and violence in order to stand up for themselves. So when they get into a situation where someone might try and bully them, if they, if they showcase that they have this ability for aggression and violence, it will actually, like Peterson says, it will actually decrease the necessity for aggression and violence to be used. And that's kind of like one practical way of integrating the shadow. And, um, that's kind of how it seems to link, uh, from what I understood. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that I think as well like specifically about integrating more aggression because we've spoke about how the dominance hierarchy the dominance hierarchy that's that's what you, you know in order that that involves some sort of competition and confrontation and in order to 
take part in that competition for dominance or or for humans maybe it's more accurate to say to to challenge yourself challenge your competence and move up the competence hierarchy as opposed to a dominance hierarchy which is predicated on violence and only violence but um but there is something to be said about if you about having the capacity for violence enabling you to not have to use that violence because you know, whilst in the modern world we're, we're very civil, um, I think the only people, it's only delusional people who who aren't very respectable that will com- that will actively confront people without the threat of violence. You think about kind of these internet kids that um, will talk shit to people online but wouldn't do anything in real life. They've kind of got an unrealistic perception of, of what's what's okay but generally in real life com- altercations even if living in a civil society the threat of violence isn't practically there that um i think there is still in any kind of confrontation it, it's kind of implicit that there is a level of you know at at the core if it were to completely degenerate it would end up being uh coming to violence like you mentioned with the uh, lobsters and with some other animals as well that they kind of have stages by which they choose to compete with so with the lobsters you mentioned how they spray the chemicals so that's like phase one and i think there was four different stages and in the middle they have some sort of altercation where they're just wrestling and then they flip the lobster onto its back and then at that point they'd consider oh now with oh i probably would have if he chose to, he would have killed me there. So now I'll back off because now we can both leave kind of unharmed and he can have his dominance and I can survive. So it's kind of mutually beneficial for both of them. And then above that, if they decide to go beyond that, then it's just complete violence. But the issue with that is that that's going to leave both lobsters, even the the lobster that loses is probably going to die. It'll be a fight to the death and the lobster that wins is probably going to be damaged. So the third lobster that comes along can come and come and take them out so so yeah there's kind of these layers uh, of dominance but but integrating your shadow and having that capacity for aggression kind of underlies the implicit threat of violence in any kind of confrontation yeah yeah like it's it's reference to the dominance hierarchy you would kind of assume like you said it's all about violence and power but there is still that kind of, oh, maybe you could call it like nobility between different animals, humans definitely, um, where there is like the sizing up of each other and the showcasing of power without its actual use. Um, and because it's so prevalent throughout different species in the world, that's why it seems so important to, for humans, I think, to me anyway. And that's why it's been so important for like me in the last year or two, <clears throat> like trying to actually just fo- not focus on it, but like realize the capacity that I have and fine tune my like physical skills through jujitsu to a point where like, I don't feel maybe don't feel as scared if I'm going to get into an altercation, but I don't feel as uncontrolled as well. So like if I was getting into an altercation a few years ago, anything could have happened. Whereas now I'd be more prevalent more aware of it happening and trying to avoid it but if it were to happen it'd be less likely for something really risky to happen if that makes sense um, and that's why it's so important to integrate a shadow on a physical level anyway um yeah that's that's a good example of de- that developing your capacity for violence reduces the uh reduces the likelihood that you'll need to use it yeah just one other point that I thought was interesting to point out was um, when you talked about how lobsters and different species will have stages to which an actual fight builds up. It's interesting. I wonder how applicable it is to other species. I know in humans, I think it was um, oh, a scientist called like David Buss or something like that, who's an evolutionary biologist. <clears throat> and he's done a lot of work on uh, studying like differences between genders. And it's interesting how, like, on probably usually it'd be nights out, I'm guessing, altercations between men will 
um, will probably have like less words. How do you say it? It's kind of like when men interact on a aggressive level, they size each other up and they know the probability of the outcome of fighting just through judging each other by face value. Whereas women, the way they, they compete with each other will be less physical and more um, emotionally aggressive. And like, it's interesting how men will kind of fight physically, but women will fight more based on like how do they emotionally damage each other. Uh, I don't know how much serotonin plays into that or, or whatever, but it's a yeah. interesting point. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting difference because he mentions in the book that um, for for a male being at the top of the dominance hierarchy, uh, at least in lobsters, but I also think this is somewhat true for, for humans as well, that as a male being at the top of the dominance hierarchy, you have preferential access to females. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, why why do you, do you have any ideas why that is? I mean, we spoke about a little bit in the previous episode in terms of personality de- or two episodes ago in the per- about personality differences, how that plays in. But why do you think um, kind of the dominance hierarchy or competence hierarchy in humans kind of applies more to men in a way than it does to women? Um, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. So almost why do, why do, let's say, would you kind of, would it be appropriate to say like a high value man has more choice when it comes to women, uh, over a high value woman having loads of choice when it comes to men? Is that kind of how you would, um, or, or would you say a high value woman still going to have more choice? It may, or do you think it's a proportional amount of more choice? That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I think I don't think it's a proportional amount. I think for as in for women, like, and I think ultimately it probably comes down to um, to women paying the higher price for pregnancy because I think there are a few rare animals where where it's like the men carry the baby like a, a seahorse or some shit. Um, but I think in those cases, it kind of flips around. Um, so... Um, yeah, there's a burden on women to choose an appropriate mate because they will have to bear the child and they'll be weak and like be more vulnerable when they are bearing a child because that's just kind of how it works. You need to be able to yeah. protect yourself when you fucking got that fragile being growing inside of you. So you need to choose an appropriate mate, make sure they have resources to protect you, provide for you. Yeah. But then, I mean, men have a, men have a higher sex drive though, on average. Um, so like, how does that play into it, do you think? Yeah, I think that's related to the same thing though, because men, for a man, it's like if you have the opportunity, like evolutionarily speaking, obviously it's more complicated when we have a society which holds where, where there's more accountability. But evolutionarily speaking, for a man to get a woman pregnant with no price for it is, is a win evolutionarily, whereas for a woman to get pregnant by any old guy is actually a bad thing because that puts themselves at risk and if they don't choose a good guy then um maybe the baby would have poor genetics and they're out of um and they're not able to have more children for for however long whereas a man can can do it more so i think yeah it's related to the same thing and in terms of coming back to the dominance hierarchy i guess that i i guess the reason it's more applicable for men in dating is because um because of the highest selection pressure and we've spoke about the evolutionary reasons for that yeah yeah if you're a high value man it's quite easy to kind of see that um although it might not be acknowledged maybe explicitly i think implicitly everybody everybody acknowledges in their own mind at least that that person has their life kind of put together a bit more than everyone else. 
And I think that's probably something that's more more acknowledged on a deeper level in women than it is men. Although men yeah. might possibly acknowledge it for jealous reasons. Um, but women will acknowledge it for more attractive reasons, I guess. Yeah, that sounds about right. But talking about the dominance hierarchy, a question I had was when I was reading it was, obviously the like neural networks that make up a lobster's brain are kind of like some of the oldest in the world. And that's quite applicable to the humans because we both um, are highly impacted by the levels of serotonin in our bodies. How applicable is this idea of the dominant hierarchy in lobsters to humans when humans live in a society where the hierarchy is more measured through competence rather than dominance? It's less maybe physical and more about competence and the value you bring to, I would always say, like your community and society through the money you bring into the economy and stuff like that. So like how applicable do you think it kind of is to put a physical, physical measurement and like findings from data onto human experience. Yeah, I I think it is still very important because although we, uh, although the dominance hierarchy is fought for in a different way, you, know, you attain it in a different way for humans. It's more through through competence and social status, which is not generally nowadays. Um, gotten through violence um but i still think the underlying effects of for example the low serotonin the effects it has on the lobster are quite similar to the effects it has on the human in terms of so so the low dominance um lobster i believe there's quite a few like genuine physical effects of it like they're less that they'll live in a higher state of stress and that they'll um you know, they'll jump on any kind of mating opportunity, uh, which in terms of humans, that kind of relates to, um, to instant gratification for people who feel that they're low in the dom in the dominance or competence hierarchy, or they have low social status. They'll feel more impulsive because they need to jump at any pleasure that they can get because the more dominant lobster or, or human would, um, you know, they have a sense of security in the future, so they're more able to delay gratification. So, yeah, I think that's one of the most important points. But but to your question, yeah, I think serotonin, the serotonin system and it, its effects when it comes to kind of social status is still very important for humans to understand, even if it is does manifest itself in a slightly different way to that of lobsters. Yeah, like, would you say that serotonin it almost acts in the same way in the body of the human and lobster. It kind of um, accentuates your posture either negatively or positively. And through that with lobsters, that kind of shows dominance in a powerful way. Whereas in humans, if you've got good posture and you look dominant in a physical way, it's acknowledged more it's, it's acknowledging a comp like more as competency it seems um in our society anyway like you see someone that's well put together and they stand up straight and they've got a good posture they've got good manners and like they speak well you don't see that as you would a lobster if you were a lobster you don't see that as oh that they have a real great capacity for violence and aggression it seems like because we've sophisticated mm -hmm. our consciousness so much just over time people see that more as competence and high value, but I guess, how would you describe high value, high value, high value? Yeah, I think the things you said there are accurate. Like you, you envision like a kind of high value guy to use maybe that overused phrase, phrase, but, um, but yeah, for a human, it's going to be someone who kind of has their life sorted out. Really, they're a respectable person. They mm. probably have good manners. They have a number of assets. They're probably economically good. So like these type of things are what matter more now. And perhaps it, perhaps it does actually come more back to what we were saying about the selection pressure being on men for for mating. So basically, that in the modern 
so, so in the modern day for a woman to have the optimal life for her and her children, the things like economics matter m more than the capacity for violence. And perhaps there's still an attractive element to the capacity for violence as it's kind of maybe more deeply wired into us. However, um, for, but it, in the modern day, uh, like economic success is more, more indicative of being able to, you know, have a good life for you and your children. So, mm -hmm. so maybe it comes back to that same, same point. Yeah. It was interesting that you mentioned like the capacity for like aggression and physical power is still something that's kind of attractive to women. But I think we talked about it when we talked about the shadow on that episode, um, women will kind of see that ultra aggressive, uh, male as attractive, but eventually over time they mature in their views and they realize that that aggressive person or boy isn't going to provide them with the emotional support that they uh, desire truly. Um, so it's more kind of like a impulse being attracted to that physical attribute of the person. Whereas when they mature, they, like you said, change their values to prioritize economic stability and like compassion and like empathy and stuff like that. Yeah. To be fair, having said that, um, like having an integrated shadow, the capacity for violence, I, I wouldn't say that's necessarily an arbitrary remnant of our evolution, uh, of, of what, what we desire evolutionarily. I think it's, but I, I think even in the modern day where, where physical violence is far less likely, like for someone to be able to stand up for themselves and to stand up for you and to protect you because there's always kind of the threat of tyranny in the world and something I've heard, I think I've heard a couple people talk about it, but it's definitely something that Jordan Peterson has mentioned is about how like there are a certain number of, so, so these kind of aggressive, some would label negative traits, these uh, can kind of be described as like the dark triads type of traits, um, which a lot of women kind of find, especially young women find attractive, but it can often be uh, the type of traits that psychopaths have. So, so those things, I forget what the exact ones are, but it's kind of like narcissist, someone narcissistic. Yeah. So, sorry, do you know them off the top of your head? Yeah, I mean, it's psychopathy and narcissism and then Machiavellianism. They're the three, I yeah. think. Yeah, so, yeah, so those, so, but it's someone with their shadow integrated, so the ideal scenario for a woman is to be with someone with their shadow integrated who maybe has some of those traits, but they're not, they're not a psychopath. So because that person would be able to stand up to the psychopaths, whereas someone who doesn't have any of those traits, but doesn't have their psych, their, their kind of, um, aggression integrated and doesn't have that kind of competence, uh, uh, and ability to stand up for themselves and other people. Like they're no use when it comes to protecting people from the actual threats of tyranny, tyranny and psychopathism in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think a point that Peterson mentioned as well, just to add on to you is like, when you don't, I don't know if it was Peterson, but someone else did like, when you don't have your shadow integrated, it's, it's also a challenge simply ident identifying that tyranny. So obviously you won't be able to like, respond to it appropriately using like, um, these acts and like opposite and appropriate forces, you won't even be able to identify it. So you're going to be able to, you'll be in danger, uh, and realize you're in the danger when it's too late almost. Yeah. It's an issue of naivety. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Sense. Someone with their shadow integrated will be more aware of the capacity for violence and destruction in others as they are aware of it in themselves. But that makes them more of a force for a good for good as well as a force for bad. But if they're properly morally aligned, then it makes them more of a force for good. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, talking about um being a force for good. I think from like the chapter it seems like 
you don't have to necessarily actively pursue that good if you kind of just pursue like physically standing up and present yourself in a good way it has these positive effects people like we said mentioned quite a few times like you, everyone sizes each other up in every species and when you kind of rise yourself up and present yourself in a good way people will treat you with more respect and that obviously has a domino effect where you feel better about yourself because people are giving you the respect that you deserve as a human all these other things and like then that goes on to improve your psyche and you kind of get into that positive feedback loop rather than the negative feedback loop which i thought was interesting it's not simply just a physical thing standing up with your shoulders back but like you said it's voluntarily taking on the challenge that life um brings and then that kind of has these these positive effects that happen with with how people treat you which is nice yeah yeah and that it, it goes to show that um like even though it's a complete transformation that kind of the start of that can be taken taking some accountability just over simply over your posture like being aware of that and just standing up straight because it's not just that our mental state affects our posture which obviously it does if you're if you're defeated or feeling low basically your serotonin is low you you're not going to have good body language um and obviously the opposite is true if you have uh, if you're feeling good but at the same time if you actively make an effort to have better body language then that will actually affect your mental state the same way it would the other way around so so yeah having good posture and you know like just carrying yourself with a bit of respect like when you shake someone's hands like looking in the eye and shaking their hands firmly like that type of thing like that yeah. can go a long way and like you said there like with a positive feedback loop particularly if you make an effort to do this when interacting with other people is probably you know is a really helpful thing yeah it kind of makes you think about the uh, discussion we had last and it was last episode we talked about like the chicken and the egg in terms of does your actions influence your psyche or is it more so that your psyche influences your actions um obviously it's a bit of both but recently i've like really kind of realized for my own life anyway that the actions are the most important thing and then as a symptom of positive actions comes the positive sense of well-being but i've started to have a bit few integrated some positive habits into my life in the last few weeks and i've been less so like listening and searching for how would you say it like um self-help teachings almost you could say and i've kind of realized that my life has kind of gotten a bit better just by focusing on the, the habits that i need to keep because they're positive habits rather than searching for an educational answer on how to do it it's more so just doing it by trial and error and uh, i think this this chapter kind of represents yeah. that um really well that's, that's why i like it to be fair yeah yeah i agree i agree yeah um it's interesting though because i was in um one of my modules this university term is i've got to study the theory behind entrepreneurship so we're not like setting a business up or anything we've got to do like a report on different theories of entrepreneurship and shit and like in the past it was kind of looked down upon by like harvard business school and oxford um because it wasn't necessarily a study of theory it was more a study of practice and practicality and like when we were we were in like a seminar the other day and like the lecturer was just saying like 90 fucking something percent of the entrepreneurs you you would actually meet would tell you like they didn't use anything they'd learned in the uni course or whatever um and it's more so just going out there trying different things seeing what is successful seeing what's failed failed and then like acting appropriately um so it's kind of maybe it's, it's maybe question a bit how important is theory like when you talk about like, when this, this book changed my life in a very significant way but it kind of makes you think would my life have been able to be changed in a more appropriate way if i just acted or was it necessary for this book to teach me things so i would have acted in the first place yeah yeah it's a good question um it's easy enough to say that if you just simply took the action 
that you needed to take, then your life would improve and you, maybe you wouldn't have to go through this middle step of, you know, finding something out which gives you a motivation or gives you a certain knowledge. But I feel like it is kind of a necessary stepping stone. And perhaps, you know, I think act taking action is more important, but it depends at what stage you are. Like for someone who's really lost and lacks a sense of direction, then they kind of don't even know what action they want to take. So in that case, it would be good to kind of learn things and yeah. and explore. And it leads into a whole conversation of how much time you should spend trying to learn versus implementing the the actions. But what you said there, yeah, I think it's, I think especially nowadays, because we have such access to an infinite amount of information, it's really easy, it's, it's too easy to get stuck in. Um, kind of a paralysis of overloading information without actually taking um, action to implement the information because information without action doesn't have really any positive effects. So yeah, I think I've noticed that in myself as well, actually, like I find I, you know, it's, it's easy and you get a kick out of learning about ways to improve your life. But um, the difficult bit is, is implementing that. And I think especially with such access to information on the internet you know it's probably a big problem for a lot of people yeah yeah 100 percent. i think it was important though what you said how when people are kind of lost and they don't have the sense of direction it is sort of necessary for them to be informed and which would, would you say maybe that action without direction or purpose could, could possibly be more detrimental than not acting uh, at times. So it could be more important for someone to learn how to direct their action in a positive way rather than just doing it by themselves. What do you think about that? I'd say sometimes it. I'd say sometimes that action would be counterproductive, but I think most of the time not because even if the action you take takes you one step backwards. I sometimes think that had you never taken that action in the first place, then it's not as if you're avoiding taking the step backwards. You're almost just delaying it because sometimes you just need to take action and then realize it's wrong before. Uh, and that's progress in itself, even if the progress is learning that you need to realign your direction. Mm -hmm. Like that, that is progress. And sometimes it takes a certain amount of time of doing something and realizing that you're not getting results before you'd actually change um to to do things that would get you the results you want so an example for me is um with the gym sometimes it feels like i could have made a lot i could have made progress a lot more efficiently had i have been more diligent about my training and more consistent with my diet and for example, always tracking my calories, I think I would have made better progress, but it maybe took me, had I've spent all that time not going to the gym, right? I would have had to spend all that extra time going to the gym eventually to realize that in order to make the progress I want, like I yeah. need to be above a certain standard, which maybe I wasn't at times, but even in that time of not making the desired progress, I think taking the action makes you learn quicker and makes the lesson stick more rather than just mindlessly consuming information. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. And then there's also such, um, such importance on the, literally, like the simple fact of just building that habit and maintaining it. Like even if you're going to the gym for the first like three months, you might be doing it, the exercises, <clears throat> not so the correct technique, but the fact that you've built that habit means that like the foundation is there for you to improve the way you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you think this is, this is kind of an argument for people reducing their media use and, and, um, information intake, even, because I found myself a lot of times, maybe I'd be, even if I was watching a lot of um, kind of useful, uh, like YouTube videos or podcasts with useful information to me, I was just kind of getting this kick out of getting all this information rather than really focusing on the action. And I have found where I've done kind of a radical reduction in the amount of intake of 
media and information, but that's kind of improved my ability to take action. And it's kind of difficult to find a balance there because I do think, it, well, it, it relates to the dopamine system. So if you're constantly getting a dopamine kick from taking in information, then you have, then you'll get less of a dopamine. It kind of undermines the dopamine kick that you get from actually taking the action because you're getting this all this other dopamine from intaking information, which requires far less effort and sacrifice than actually taking action. So do you think this is kind of a good argument for reducing your, your media use and information intake? Yeah, I think it is. I think, um, like an example I know of is my cousin. Like he, um, I hate, like him, him overall, he tries to, he's like very focused and he's very much aligned his purpose with his action, like aligned his actions with his purpose. Um, so he trains hard, he does like things he needs to do. And he doesn't really like to take in media. Like, he doesn't watch the news. Like we were literally watching the news this morning because I came, he came around for breakfast and the news was on TV. He was like, oh, do you want to change this? Like all the fucking news does is just make you sad and shit. Um, but separate from that, like, I think other, like you're saying media outlets that you could view as positive, like information, um, and like, educational uh, videos on YouTube. I think they do serve more so as an, a distraction from simply acting like for example you could watch like a million videos on like how to have a better well-being and like be more at peace with yourself but it's like can you get a better education from that or would you get a better education from going and living out in the woods by yourself for like three months i guess maybe the yeah the only yeah, like that's how the nuance in that could be possibly like the timing it takes. Like if it, if it did take three months to get by yourself in a cabin, could you maybe cram in different videos uh, that maybe you have to watch three hours a day for a week and then that does increase your well-being maybe more proportionally com <clears throat> compared to the time that you spent doing, like, focusing on it? Maybe there's an argument there, but I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting topic of discussion. Uh, do you want to move on to the next point? Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, so we, before we kind of went up on the tangent, we brief, briefly discussed how the physical... Um, the physical like factors of standing up straight and having a posture and things along those lines definitely influences the psyche, but other things that I mentioned uh, that are definitely really important are like your diet and sleep pattern. Um, like that imp impacts serotonin too. Like, you, <clears throat> we don't want people to take away from this episode that it's simply all about physical health. Well, I guess you could argue that would still have a positive net effects on your life, but it's not just about physically standing up straight. It's also about spiritually and like metaphysically taking on the challenges that life throws at you and voluntarily kind of stepping into the abyss and working towards a goal and like improving your diet, making sure you're strict with it, but not too strict to a point where you kind of don't enjoy eating at all. And then just get into the habit of having like a, a nice structured routine that you replicate every day for your sleep. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on that Pete? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, like with this, with the serotonin thing, like the whole effects it has on your brain, doing these little habits, um, the type of thing that like Andrew Huberman talks about, like, uh, getting sunlight in your eyes in the morning, have a consistent circadian rhythm, um, exercise in a certain amount, there's benefits to cold showers and things like that. Doing these things to optimize your physiology, I think is one of the most important factors for for having a good mental state and i do think that relates to it kind of sets yourself up for success in the kind of realm of having better body language and having higher serotonin and can help create this positive momentum which creates a positive feedback loop for you to improve yourself and yeah. as we were saying that 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 comes from taking action rather than 
from um, kind of passively consuming information, which if anything kind of does the opposite because, you know, you're, you're literally not taking action. And a lot of people, I think, kind of just get entertainment from taking in all this entertainment and motivation and dopamine kit from taking in this motivational and educational content where they're not really benefiting if they're not applying it. Yeah, there needs to be that application. Um, and that's not to disregard having a, a more focused application through contemplation of like, of one's life, <clears throat> like going back to that point of staring into the abyss, that obviously teaches you a lot. And although we, like you mentioned, how staring into the abyss isn't just about um, mentally contemplating things, it's also about taking action. But um, yeah, the physical, it seems to yeah. be anyway, the physical, the physical, um, I would say the physical, the physical habits will definitely have a bigger impact on your psych psyche more so than your psyche will have an impact on your physical habits. Um, although like we yeah. obviously previously discussed it's quite, it can be challenging to, to build these physical habits and maintain them when you kind of have, don't have that m men mental, men mo mental motivation there to, uh, to start and continue them. But, um, but that's just the fucking hard challenge that everybody faces in the world. And, if other people can do it, then fucking everyone can, realistically. Yeah, it's just difficult because um, it's not like there will be points where it's just not not a glamorous thing. You were, you are just going to have to do things that you don't feel like doing, and a lot of times the motivation to do that is not going to be there. But um, but yeah, just gotta just gotta do it, conquer the inner bitch. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's um, a task that everyone has to face every day. I think it doesn't seem like anyone's ever going to complete that, uh, that fucking monumental task when you think about it. But, um, but yeah, any other points you want to mention, Pete? Um, you know, I think that's. That's good for an episode, actually. I think we've we've covered the main points from the uh, from the from the book. Is there anything else you want to say? You had that other topic, but I think we'll maybe leave that for another episode. Yeah, yeah. I think we've uh, kind of discussed it uh, thoroughly enough to satisfy my needs and desires. Um, no, yeah, I think that's, that's been a good episode. I think. What would you say is a key takeaway? Just to like summarize. Um, I'd say stand up straight with your shoulders back, obviously the name of the, the thing. So, so implement that in terms of your posture. I'd say try and realize that your previous mistakes, that or the, the ways you've acted because previously you, it, it might have got you through a hard time. If that's not serving you now, you do you do have the power to change. And I think try to see um, see the potential through through challenges rather than seeing them as a threat. To see kind of the gold that the dragon hoards, rather than being paralysed by the fear of the dragon. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think it embracing challenges and and trying to build up that positive feedback loop i think that's that's really the big takeaway from this chapter yeah i'd also like to add just it seems like quite a novel thing simply like physically standing up straight and stuff but it is not just a novel thing it does have these like consequences consequences that serve everybody in a positive way um so don't forget that like I find myself forgetting to just sit back and all this shit. But when I yeah. do that, there is that small, small change in like the way I view the situation I'm in and stuff, and it is very beneficial. So I don't disregard the uh, yeah simplicity of it. Yeah, it's an important point. It's kind of just about acting as the person you want to be, like on a daily basis, just 
just yeah. you know standing up straight walking with good posture looking people in the eyes when you talk to them shake people's hands firmly um stand up for what you believe in pursue what you believe is right like all these things yeah. um so yeah it's a great chapter one of my favorite from both of his books really oh, i still need to read the second uh the second book but yeah um we'll definitely be doing another chapter review in the future uh, i'm not too sure how soon that will be uh, that will be a surprise for everybody, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think we could probably end yeah. it there, I guess. Um, thank you for joining us, guys. It's been a pleasure. Uh, you can check us out on Spotify, YouTube. Um, newspapers might have us. You never know. Probably not. Um, yeah, maybe. Thanks again. Um, yeah, it is currently 39 past four in the evening. <laughs> it's been a lovely chat with you, Pete. Um, I'll see you next time. Bye. As always, I'll see you in a bit.